Uh, I'm going to be in different places this morning. Um, you can take your bulletin and turn to the back, and you can find there a little spot maybe to take some notes. So I hope you will, because uh, this is going to help you. It's going to help uh, people. It's going to help the world. So um, we do understand why we're here. We're not just getting refilled for another week. We're not just here so we can get the week started out great. We're not, you know what I mean? A lot of those things that I think the enemy would love to convince you that this is all about. I mean, it's no problem with that, but, you know, he's got you here. He's put you here with God's people to, to equip you with truth, to equip you for the work of the ministry that's, that's, that can go on here. But, man, you got a lot of time between now and the next time we meet. Amen? You agree? So uh, God's just trying to put the right tools in your hands to effectively minister to the world that's bound and living in darkness around you. So just keep that perspective this morning as we dive in. Um, maybe the word's not necessarily for you as much as it is somebody else. But uh, again, we'll be in different places. The title is Hearing Trouble. Hearing Trouble. And uh, I'll make the question clear in a moment. But uh, last week, I think it was last week no it wasn't last week it was the week before last because i know brother keith was here on sunday morning i hope that you enjoyed getting the opportunity to hear from him um but the the sunday before we sang a hymn that i literally have sung i know over a hundred times and i think the title of the hymn is praise the lord it's one that's early on in the hymn book okay and uh especially when we were at bethany uh, you might, it might be funny to think about this, but I would actually lead the hymns in our first service. I think that's funny, you know, now that I, I just, I see it and I just, I wish I had a video of that. I'd keep it to myself, but I wish I did have a video to look back on some prior days of ministry. And, but I can remember that my wife will tell you that was one of our pianist and organist's favorites. They were most familiar with it. So it seemed like every Sunday we started the service with it. And, uh, but for the first time two weeks ago, I heard something in that hymn that I, that I don't think I've ever heard. And in the chorus, it goes, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. And all of a sudden, I think maybe that me and that author of that hymn really connected. Because if there's one thing that needs to happen in this nation it is truly to hear the voice of God because there are so many things man that the enemy's using to keep us from hearing that voice because if God speaks the only thing that comes out of his mouth is truth do you agree the, the scripture even says that to us God cannot lie so everything that comes out of God's mouth is truth and we also have a very important detail about the truth from Scripture is, is that when you know the truth, in other words, you've heard it, you've, you've, you've gone beyond just the information, God's turned the light switch on, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So it may be hard for you to realize it, but, but, but for some of you that may be experiencing some real bondage right now and just some really difficult times and you're struggling, it may be hard to realize that the difference is really in who you're listening to and believing, but I guarantee you that's what the problem is. It's what the problem is. Because the enemy, man, he just so, so good at bringing in his lies, his deceit, and, and somehow working things out and deceiving us into believing what he wants us to believe rather than hearing the truth and believing what God wants to believe. That's the difference in life and death, ladies and gentlemen. It's that simple. I've grown to believe that whatever your life is producing today, whatever it is, your attitude, your actions, it's based on underneath the surface who you're choosing to listen to and believe. So that hymn really took on a new meaning. Let the earth hear his voice. You see, the treasure of the new covenant that you and I have the very privilege to, to live under, okay, the, the treasure of it is God himself. It's, it's the Spirit. Okay? It's, it's the Spirit. All right? You read Jeremiah chapter 31. You read Ezekiel 36. The prophets spoke of this day. 
And at the very center of, of the heart of the new covenant was the Spirit. I'm going to come inside. I'm going to live in my people, and I'm going to cause them to walk in my ways. You know, they're like lost sheep right now. They're dead spirits. But man, I'm coming in. I'm bringing life, and I'm going to do something inside. I'm going to cause them to walk in my ways. The Holy Spirit is the treasure of it. Now, I want to I take you through a little journey real quick. John 16, 33. You can write the verse down as you follow along. But John 16. 16, verse 30, or John 16, 13, here's what it says. 14, 15, 16, Jesus provides a lot of information about the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to read one verse that says this. However, when he, the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, now notice this promise, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. So what is Jesus saying that the Holy Spirit's going to do when he's poured out later on in the book of Acts? What's he going to do? He's going to, he's going to speak. And not what he wants to speak in essence, but he's going he's to speak what he hears. So in essence, what's going to happen is the Father is going to speak, but he's going to speak to you through a spirit that he's going to put inside you. It's not going to just be with you as Jesus told you. He's going to be where? In you. So then the book of Acts, which is really cool, you have the fulfillment of this. I want you to write these verses down. You can go back and study them. Ready? Acts 8.29. Acts 10.19. Acts 10.19. Acts 10, 19. And then Acts 13, verse 2. So Acts 8.29, Acts 10.19, Acts 13.2. Each of these verses... Use this phrase, the Holy Spirit said. The Holy Spirit spoke. Now you go back and read the context. The first one in chapter 8 was about Philip. It was the Holy Spirit telling Philip to leave a revival and go out into the desert and meet one man. And the Spirit told him, go and overtake that chariot. In other words, he got there, and you know, he's seeing this great caravan, and the Spirit spoke in that moment and said, go to that chariot. Now let me ask you a question. Do you believe that happened? Let me ask you another question. Do you believe that happened? Let me ask you another question. Do you believe that happened? Acts chapter 10, verse 19, Peter's on the scene. He has this vision, and the Bible says the Holy Spirit said. Again, providing direction about things that were getting ready to happen. In Acts chapter 13, it is the case where the Holy Spirit spoke to the congregation and told them exactly who, they, who he wanted appointed to a particular ministry, which was Paul and Barnabas in that case. The Holy Spirit spoke. In other words, the promise of John 16, 13, the writer of the book of Acts, which is Luke, is showing us how that was fulfilled, okay? Everybody tracking with me? Because see, for a long time, I thought that the only way God spoke was through his word. We've been taught that. I don't know about you guys. I've not gone back and listened to every message you've ever heard. But a lot of us have grown to believe that the only way God ever speaks to us is through his word. Thank God he does speak to us through his word. And I know that God's never going to speak to you in a way that's contrary to his word. Okay, did you hear that? He's not going to say something that's going to just all of a sudden the spirit of God is going to say, now there is no longer one way to God, now there's two ways to God. He's not going to do that because that would contradict everything God took the time to speak to us through the word to show us that Jesus is his provision, that Jesus is the way to him. But I always believed that the only way God spoke was the Word. If I wanted to hear God speak, I had to go to the Word. But you study these couple of passages in the book of Acts, and you see that the Spirit of God was in believers providing very clear direction as to what He wanted His people to do. So let me ask you a question. This happened in the book of Acts. Do you still believe it happens today? So the question for today is this. What keeps you from hearing that voice? 
So it's really interesting how God did this because for me, this is the weird way I look at it, but you know, for so long, man, I, w- I want to be Jesus in the world because I've always been taught that Jesus is an example. He's a picture of the relationship that you and I can enjoy with the Father. You know, so I'm, I want to be Jesus in the world. And so as time has progressed, I've often in the back of my mind had that question, okay, God, what was the problem? Well, he's shown me the essence of the problem is in hearing. <laughs> is in hearing. And so you can't help but ask, well, why was I not hearing? What was I not doing or what was happening? And so God has made that clear to his word. So I'm going to give you three things this morning. You ready? Three points in a poem, right? Three points, a story at the end, and we're all done, right? So just three things. I call them hearing impediments. Things that God has made very clear to me that keep us from hearing his voice. They'll help you. Because I promise you, you can apply it, and you'll see it later on. Okay, so you're ready for the three things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them to you. First of all, I want to talk to you about the wisdom of man. So what, what, is, what is one thing that keeps us from hearing from God that's very clear from Scripture? It is the wisdom of man. You see, when you read the Scripture, there's this contrast. There's this comparison between two things a lot. Good, evil, spirit, flesh, light, dark. Uh, wisdom of God, wisdom of man, God, the enemy. There, there's just, just two. Okay? So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 real quick. There's a few verses here. You can go back and read both passages of Scripture. It, it will greatly help you. Um, but 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness of those who are perishing. Now, what's the, what's the message of the cross? The, the cross is God's means of reconciling himself to man, right? So essentially what Paul's saying is that to go and tell the world that to be right with God is something that Jesus has already done. It's a gift to be received. The world looks at that, and what, what's their response? Ludicrous. It's crazy. It's absurd. It's too good to be true. So the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen? It is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom, or through its wisdom, the world through its wisdom did not know God. It pleased God that through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who who believe. So here's the reality. You don't come to know God through the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of man. Because man would never, ever, ever choose it to be this way. Man would choose salvation or relationship with God to be something that you had to merit or earn, right? Because you, you, you're never going to get anything great in life without working for it. You're never going to get anything great in life without a great sacrifice. Well, in this case of the gospel and the message of the cross, it wasn't my sacrifice. It was his. It was his suffering. It was his death. That, the Word of God says, brings us to life's greatest treasure, and that's God himself. So it is the wisdom. So when we talk about wisdom, what are we talking about? We're talking about ideas. We're talking about thoughts. We're talking about viewpoints, principles, those of God and those of man. Now, look down with me at chapter 2, verse 6. However, we speak wisdom not among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. need to highlight that. Because what Paul is trying to say here is that this wisdom that comes from the world, this wisdom that comes from man, that comes from the rulers of this world is coming to nothing. And one day the truth of God will be laid bare before every man. 
we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for they had known, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love God. Him. And a lot of times we take that passage and we point it towards heaven and we talk about, oh, the things that are waiting for us in heaven. But here's the point of verse 10. Look what it says. The things that we say are future, look what it says. But God has revealed them. These things that I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered in the heart of, God has revealed them how? Through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things, or yeah, spiritual things with spiritual things. So you see how Paul is comparing the two? The wisdom of God, the wisdom of man. You see, the two are radically different. Isaiah 55 is a, is a chapter that you can write down, but God here through Isaiah makes it very clear that you know, guys, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. What I'm realizing is that the pattern or the habit of my life is to lean to my own understanding. And you say, what do you mean, Pastor? Pastor. Because here's the honest truth about me. When the pressure gets on in my life, it's not the norm or the pattern or the habit of my life to stop and to say, God, what do you think? What about you? I told a guy this story yesterday, and I hadn't told anybody this, what happened, and you know, I told him at the time I probably would never do it, but this morning for some reason God said tell it, so I don't know why I'm telling this, but it's a little embarrassing. But the other day I was at IGA, and this guy in a white van drove by. I hope it was none of you, because if I find out it was you, then I've got a few words for you. But, uh, and I don't care how big you are either. I'll bring Jeremy with me, so... But I was at IGA the other day, and, uh, you know, they've got it poured right there as you walk out the glass doors out of the supermarket part. They've got an area poured with concrete, and uh, then, of course, there's the asphalt. And I literally, I was just about to take a step onto the asphalt, and a man in a white van, I mean, no exaggeration, he, he was this close to me. And I don't know how fast a man was going. I could say 60 mile an hour, and you'd just laugh. But no, he was going fast. I'm serious, he was going really fast. And not only that, but when I looked up and I saw him, he's on a telephone in a parking lot. And as soon as he went by, I turned and looked, and there was a woman there with a kid about Grant's size. And so all I can tell you is in about 0.23 tenths of a second, I went from 98.6 degrees to about 300 degrees, okay? And so I never thought, I, got, I saw him fly up through the Buffalo Shoals gas pumps. I saw him getting, or the gas pump, I saw him get out on Buffalo Shoals Road. The light held him up. I jumped in my truck. I got on 16, and I literally was going to cut him off. So I know you're like, oh my gosh, my preacher. Well, I'm, I told you, it's embarrassing. But literally, I, I get, I'm, I'm telling you, the light turns yellow. And so you young drivers do not follow your pastor's lead. But when it went yellow, I hit the gas because he's already made his turn down 16, and I'm going to beat the light. Now, honestly, at this point, I have no clue what I'm going to do. I, I, I'm hoping that as I'm driving, reality's going to hit, and you're going to go, 
what are you doing? I mean, what do you really think you're about to do? But my mindset was, I'm going to let this man know what a stupid thing he just did in this parking lot, you know? I got to that light. It was yellow. I went from slamming on the gas to hitting my brake just like that because it, was, it would have been red as I was going under it. And at that time, I mean, I stopped physically in my vehicle, but I am telling you this is no lie. I heard God as clear as it is day. I heard him say, stop. I heard him say, stop. And you're saying, what do you, here's the thing. What God did was he used this as a perfect illustration of what I'm telling you right now. Because our habits, our patterns are when things go bad. And when something's happening we don't like, I don't care if it's something in our own lives with relation, family, whatever it is, something we, it's immediate that we start running our mouths and we get angry and we're going to fix it. And so what God revealed to me in that moment was this truth. How the wisdom of man, the ways of man, the ideas, the principles, the viewpoints of man. Because man says what? This guy did a do stupid thing, man. You need, to, you need to shut this guy down, man, and make sure he don't ever do something like this again. Because, man, if your boy had been there, I'm going to tell you where Grant's usually at. He's not behind me. He's in front of me. And God only knows what could have happened in that situation. But it didn't, and I'm not fretting that because it's not the point. The point is you and I understanding that God's desire is to speak into our lives, okay? And there's some things that aren't black and white. They're not at verse this, chapter this, verse whatever. They're not there. You need direction. What do I do in my life? And so you know what I believe God wants? And he clearly says it. He just wants us to learn to stop and ask. <laughs> You've been given the greatest treasure you could ever imagine in the Holy Spirit who promised that he was going to speak, who was proven in Acts 6 that he will speak. Ask other believers. You've got your pastor. Others of you have had God speaking into your life. It's there. God continues to do what he said he was going to do. But the thing of it is, are we stopping and asking? Or are we manipulating and conniving and trying to figure out and make sure that what we want to happen happens? Because we're convinced it is so. Can you imagine a congregation of believers? I don't care how side, what the size is. If we could all learn to develop the pattern of just simply stopping and saying, God, what do you think? Every time I've ever done it, you know what God has done? He's spoken to me. He's made his path clear for me. And it wouldn't have been the thing that I would have chosen. It, it's just, it works out. You know, Brian and myself, a couple of weeks back, a buddy of ours, Jason, our ministry partner in Westlaco, was, he was, um, he had came home to Wilkesboro to see some family and he had driven our van. I don't know if I told you this, but it's funny because his, the van broke down. He got all the way here, 20 hours, and the van breaks down here. He's up there in Wilkesboro somewhere off. They were eating, and, and his van breaks down. Well, he calls, Brian was with me, and, and he calls us to let us know kind of what's happening. Well, even in that moment, you know, Brian will tell you, we were laughing about it the other day. I mean, immediately, what do I do? I try to fix it. Well, I'm going to call this one. I'm going to call that one. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to fix it all. And the whole time, the crazy thing of the matter is, is that he had broken down at a chicken house where the son of the wife, who, or the woman that owned the chicken house, was a, a mechanic. <laughs> and it just so happened, I found out Friday, that he specialized in Ford vehicles. See, man's wisdom would say, just fix it. But understand, God's ways are not ours. And all your preacher is trying to encourage you to learn to do is just will you be willing to stop and ask him? And you just might find that he says, wait. Or maybe he's going to do something else. 
But do you see where the wisdom of man comes in and we get so busy doing things the way the world says do it that we're so busy doing that that we couldn't hear God if we, try, I mean, if we wanted to. It's like noise for me. Have you ever had somebody, maybe somebody younger than you, have you ever made this statement, man, I just wish they'd have asked me what I thought. Because <laughs> they went on on their own and they assumed what they, what they thought you were thinking in a situation. You're like, man, I just wish they'd have asked. I mean, I just imagine God. No, he doesn't reproach us in any way. But I just had this feeling that God's, why do my people not ask me? I mean, I told them when I said the Spirit was coming, He was going to speak. He was going to guide them into the truth and talk about things to come. I promised it and I showed it in Acts, in the Word, I, where I fulfilled that. But they just asked me. Because here's the thing. I, I think things would have been a lot different at IGA if I'd have jumped in my car and just said, hey, God, what do you think about all this? You, you, you really think God would have said, man, I want you to get in your truck. I want you to act like a nut. And I want you to floor your truck, and I want you to drive way over the speed limit, putting every other driver's life in jeopardy, and I want you to track that guy down. I want you to yank him out of his car. I want you to slap him around about four or five times. And when you're done doing that and giving him a tongue lashing, I want you to slap him around a few more times. Now, some of y'all may think God works that way, but, <laughs> you know, Jesus didn't do it. Here's what Jesus did. This is what Jesus did. See, we forget the reality that nobody took his life. He laid it down. And he laid it down because he was listening. Mark 8, 33, you want to read this. You've got to read this one because this one, man, God just slapped me in the head and I've never seen it before. I mean, I've seen it, but not like this. In Mark 8, Jesus for the first time starts talking about his impending suffering and death. But he also, man, talks about the resurrection, but the guys are not hearing that. You know, he, he's talking about suffering and dying. And, and so he, he gets over there in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, and he's having a conversa conversation. You'll have to read it. But he's, immediately when he starts talking about that, Peter pulls Jesus to the side. Now, this is a little bit funny to me. Okay, here's Jesus, God's Son, declaring the, the plan of God from the foundation of the world that I'm going to suffer and die. So, oh, Peter, big bad Peter, man. Which is me and you, by the way, in the story, if you want to find yourself. <laughs> oh, Peter pulls Jesus aside and says, Jesus, this will not be so. This is not going to happen, right? Look, Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke Jesus. Isn't that a little bit funny to you? And then next verse. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. How many of you got an old King James? What's the word that it uses? Thou what? Thou savorest not. In other words, what Jesus was saying to old Peter is, Peter, the problem is you don't have a taste for the things of God. Your taste buds are more for the things of men. And see, that's the reality, y'all. Our taste is more for the wisdom of man because it lines up with more of what we think and how we want to do things because we want to do it, we want it now, and we want to do it in our ability, right? We want to be in control. But here's what God's up to. Aren't you glad that because of grace, he wants to change your tastes? He wants to give you more of a taste for the things of the Spirit of God instead of the things of the Spirit of this world. And if we'll let him do it, he'll transform that. I can tell you right now in my life, at 40 years old, my tastes are way more, way more for the things of the Spirit of God than they've ever been in my whole life. And it's all because of what he's doing. You see, God's revelation, it just, I, I, I struggle because it don't fit. It doesn't fit with what I want and when I want it. Because sometimes, you know, God's word is weight. Write down Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 real quick. 
Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Solomon, wow. God had blessed that man with the awesome gift of wisdom. And you know what he said? Here's what he said. He said, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Somebody finish it. And what? And lean not to your own understanding. But what? But acknowledge him in all of your ways, and he will direct your paths. Good job, Mike. Don't forget it. Lean not to your own understanding. Your understanding will deceive you, guys. And your intentions may be great. I look back at my life and say, man, I, I just great intentions. I mean, my intentions that day, me and Brian, we, we will fix Jason. We will help Jason. God had other plans. Here's a man now. He's able to share the gospel with a chicken farmer. And her son. So I guess the question is, how many of us stop when the pressure's on? When there's a decision to be made, do we really care what God thinks? Luke eleven twenty eight. 28, blessed are those who hear the word of the Lord and keep it. So I'm just going to give you these last two, and you can work on them on your own. But the last two are this, and we may finish them next time. But you got the wisdom of man. That, that's something that just really keeps us from asking. God, what do you, what do you think? But then there's the traditions of man. And this is where, this is where we're going to get personal. Because sometimes, man, traditions, ways of doing things year after year, whether it comes from family traditions or whether it's church traditions or whether it's your own personal traditions or whatever they are, Jesus, go home tonight, read Mark chapter 7. And the reason the Pharisees couldn't get from death to life the reason they couldn't get from being just a great religious person that, man, the whole world looked at them and held them on high esteem as the spiritually elite, but the reason they couldn't get from there to the life of Jesus is because of a lot of their traditions. And Jesus said, because you would, Mark seven thirteen, because you will not lay aside your traditions, you strip the Word of God of its power and of its authority in your life. Because there are some people that they won't ask God, God, what do you think? Because they've done something in their life or in their family or in their churches for so many years. They won't even stop to say, God, do you, do you, hey, maybe there's something different here. And you know how I know this? Because I've been there. <laughs> I mean, as a pastor, you, you know, for last bit, you, you think, well, it's always been done. What you got to do? Blah, 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 all the stuff. And what I've grown to realize is what really matters is what God is thinking. And so uh, you need to really spend some time with that. And I'll tell you this quick story. There was a man one day, he noticed his wife kept cutting off both ends of the hams, but, but the ham before she would cook it. Now, I've told this to you before, but I've got to tell you to remind you. His wife was always cutting the ends of the ham off. And he said, doggone, I'm going to get to the bottom of this thing. So he asked his wife, he said, honey, why are you cutting both ends of the ham off? Well, my mom always did this, you know, so I'm... You know, and he was just like, well, one day he saw his mother-in-law. He decided, all right, I'm going to really get to the bottom of this thing. Well, he asked his mother-in-law, well, my wife, you know, she's always cutting both ends of the ham off before she cooks it. Can you explain to me? She says, it's something you used to do. Can you explain to me why you would cut both ends? And she said, well, easy, because my pan was too small. You see whether it be your families, whatever it is, man, they, they, I'm sure there were great reasons why people did things. But what about today? Are you hearing what God is saying for today? Now, some of you, I'm going to tell you, this is going to challenge you because the enemy interprets it to you as he's getting me. He, he's coming at me. He's, he's this. I'm going to tell you, you better be careful. But what matters at the end of the day is me hearing what God is saying. And so you, you can't deny, I'm here to try and lead people to life. Because when you get a hold of life, everybody around you is going to get a big, fat dose of life. And that life can only come as we hear and walk in the truth. Now, you're not looking at a man that's perfected this. I still pull the whole thing on myself of, you know, I've never done it that way before. 
So you mean I'm literally going to not hear what God wants to say because of that? Think about that, y'all. Because there's more at stake than just your family tradition. There's a world. There's a world that's in need. The last thing is this. It's, it's, I, I, I'm still working through this. Maybe you've got an idea of how to phrase it. But the last thing I, 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 I mentioned was the voice of man. You've got the wisdom of man. You've got the traditions of man. And then you've got the voice of man. And, 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 and here's the thing with me. I use Acts 17, 10, and 11. It's just a passage that God just impressed upon my heart. You go read it. Paul goes into the town of Berea. He goes in there. He teaches the message of the gospel. Well, the Bereans, the Bible says, were more noble and fair-minded than the others. And so here's what they did. Listen, real quick. I'm about done. Just relax. It says that what the Bereans did is they went and they took hold of the Scriptures and they searched the Scriptures out to make sure that old Paul, that what he was saying was the truth. How many of us really do that? How many of us instead, we take somebody that we respect and we assume that every single thing that they say is right and so that rather than running the thought or the idea or the principle through the Word of God, through the filter of the Word, we run it through what some man has said. I'm going to tell you something real quick. I have not always said it right. There is no pastor on this planet, including Billy Graham himself, that has all, always said it right, ladies and gentlemen. None of us have. So if you're not careful, the enemy will take those things and he will make it fact, he will make it rule, he will make it law in your life that just because some man said it, that it has to be that way. But here's all I'm saying. Who's the authority? See, what we've elevated is we've taken all the big shots and all the pastors of big churches and all the people with the degrees, and we hold them up here. And we say, well, doggone it, if they've said it, it has to be true. But is that the case? Now, what you need to do on this one is you need to read Mark chapter 9, Transfiguration. Cool passage. Transfiguration, everybody's hanging out, good time. All of a sudden, Moses, Elijah show up. And then the three, Peter, James, and John, are like, man, we need to build some tabernacles and all of us hang out. And then guess what happened? Moses and Elijah disappeared. They're gone. And you know what happens at that moment? A voice comes out of heaven and said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. You see, because Moses and Elijah, their job was to do nothing more than to point to this guy right here. Jesus, this is the one you need to be listening to. So what I'm saying is that a lot of times what happened in my life, I've, I've had great, impactful individuals in my life. But there was a time in my life when I thought if my seminary president said it, it had to be true. I had to do it. I had to believe it. I had to go with it. And guys, listen, all I'm saying is this. No disrespect to people, but you better take what I'm saying, and I double-dog, triple-dare you to take what I'm saying and test it by the Word of God. The, enemy, the, in, the minute he shows up and starts questioning it, what am I saying? Just test it with the Word of God. You determine for yourself. Is he, a, is he a, being a spokesperson for God or is he just saying what he wants to say? Test it. But don't let man be the final authority. Can I get an amen on that one, please? I know that's challenging all of us, but this is God saying, Matt, here's why you hadn't heard me all these years. You've been relying on man's wisdom. You won't let go of your traditions. And you're thinking that man is the ultimate authority. No, I am. So won't you ask me what I think? So here's the, the, the invitation, guys. Listen, uh, the altar's open. You know, what does God think? Maybe some of you are really, really struggling right now with something. And if you're like me, maybe there hadn't been a time when you've really humbly said, God, what? do you think how should I handle this what should I do I don't know I got another story for you but I'll save it for another time let's pray father thank you for today just thank you I go back to the beginning Lord of 
in spite of me, in spite of my choices, you've loved me and you've made a way for me. You've made a way for me to be in relationship with you and you've given me access through the Spirit to hear you. And as your word says, the Spirit was given to make known to us all the things that are freely given. And so, God, I'm just going to believe that promise. I'm going to believe what Jesus promised the Spirit would do. I'm going to believe the fulfillment of that in the book of Acts. I'm going to believe the voice I've heard in my mind and how it's led me and guided me. And, Lord, I'm going to continue to pray for more discernment on hearing your voice versus that of the enemy, versus the ways of the world, versus my traditions and and the authority of man. God, I want to hear the voice clearly because I want to be Jesus in this world. This world needs Jesus. The world doesn't need any more good religious people who are faithful to their buildings and all those things, which all that's great. And I'm grateful for everybody that comes here every week. But God, there's something where we're about to leave this place. We're about to leave this place. And who we choose to listen to and who we choose to listen to believe is going to affect our families. It's going to affect the people we're around at our jobs. It's going to affect the people that we meet here, there, anywhere. God, it's going to impact our choice when we leave this building, who we're going to listen to. So God, help us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your commitment to us. Thank you that we're your project, that we're your workmanship, that what you've started you will complete. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. We'll wait for just a few moments.